time in a far off land wise men saw a sign set out across the sand songs of praise to sing to travel day and night precious gifts to bring guided by the light they chased a brand new star ever towards the west the mountains was far when they came to rest they scarce believed their eyes they came so many miles this miracle they prized was nothing but a child nothing but a child those tears away hide a weary world to the light of day nothing but a child could help erase those miles so once again we all can be children I'm really glad you're here today. Thanks for coming in. And uh, today's a special day in our church. It's called Epiphany Sunday. Now, does anybody know what Epiphany is about? Anything? Any, anybody? Then I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> this is the right place to be. Uh, Epiphany is a, a day. It's actually uh, was Friday, January 6th, this Epiphany. We're celebrating it today on, uh, on Sunday. Um, and it's the day when we finish up the Christmas season. Because remember, Christmas is not just a day. It's a season of 12 days of Christmas. You know the song? Those are over. And we end that season by recognizing the arrival of the Magi, the three kings, the wise men, to Bethlehem to worship Jesus. And uh, we remember... Uh, that they came a long ways to get to, to, to Bethlehem. And does anybody know how they found Jesus? What guided them there? Yeah. The star, right. The star guided them all this long journey from one part of the Middle East to another part of the Middle East. Long journey. They were guided by a star. So on Epiphany, we remember the Magi, the wise men, the three kings, uh, they called those things, uh, and the star. That guided them those two things the magi and the three kings and epiphany is a is also a season so it's the season that leads us all the way up to lent which we'll talk more about later but but so today i've been thinking this week i've been thinking about um stars 
and not just the star that guided the, the uh, wise men to Bethlehem, but how people can be stars in our lives. And I have in my little basket here some stars, and I'm going to give each of you one of these um, when we're finished. And I want you to take it with you, and I want you to th think about... Mm -hmm. I'm going to save it here. Um, I want you to think about somebody in your life who is a star to you, somebody who guides you closer to God, somebody who guides you to Jesus, somebody who reminds you of God's love and God's presence in your life, somebody special in your life who helps you know God better. And you can write their name on it if you want. You can write on these. And give it to that person as a way of saying thank you for helping me know God better in my life, know Jesus better in my life, and give it to them. Now, uh, if it's somebody who lives far away, you can put it in the mail. If it's somebody who's passed away, uh, you can put it on the wall uh, of your room or on the fridge in the kitchen or something like that as a way of remembering them as well. So take this with you and somebody who is a star that guides you closer to God in your life. And then I'm going to give you another star. So you're going to get two. This one will be for you to keep as a reminder that you can be a star that can guide other people closer to God and closer to Jesus by the way you act, right? By the way you help people or remind them that they're loved, that they're included, that they're valued um, in, in uh, your life or in your school or in, in the church here. Uh, guiding them closer to God and God's presence in their life. Maybe it's saying, hey, come on to church with me and see what's going on here. We've got some cool stuff happening at my church. That's guiding them closer to God. You can be a star that guides people, that shines God's light into their lives. Okay? So that's what Epiphany is about. The wise men, the star that guided them, and how people in our lives can be stars that guide us closer to God. And that we, each one of us, can be stars that guide other people closer to God, too. Yeah, Eden. Why do we always get a marker to write it? Say again? Do we get like a marker to write it? I don't have markers, um, but I'm sure there might be some in Sunday school, or if not, when you take it home, when you take it home, you can write it on there, too, because I'm sure you have markers at home, okay? All right, so I'm going to give each of you two stars as you go um, and as we sing our next hymn. And then off to Sunday school for you folks. Thanks for coming up. And please rise for our next hymn. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we're glad that you found your way here uh, this morning to First Congregational Church. If you are new among us, do take advantage of the guest registry that's in the uh, narthex of the church and sign your name in there, and we can send you our uh, online uh, an email for our newsletter. I uh, hope you get to know us a little bit better, and uh, hopefully you can find this to be your church home um, and with, among the, uh, the spirituality and activities and ministries that we have going on here. Um, just to highlight uh, a few announcements, after worship today, uh, right here in the sanctuary, I'm probably going to get this going as quickly as possible because I know folks need to get places uh, uh, this morning. Um, we're starting our confirmation program uh, here at our church for this year. It's been a, uh, there's been a hiatus on this program uh, because of COVID, of course, and the pandemic, uh, but we are back. And so after worship today is our confirmation orientation meeting. It's for uh, youth and parents. Who are interested in the program. This is for youth who are eighth grade through, through high school. Uh, so if you want to stick around uh, and find out more, I'll be talking about the uh, character of the program, um, the importance of the program, and also uh, passing around a syllabus and a schedule of classes uh, for uh, the program. So that's after worship right here in the sanctuary. We'll get rolling with that right away. Wednesday uh, of this week, 9 o'clock uh, in the lounge, which is that room right over there, uh, the uh, men's group will be meeting. Uh, and if you haven't joined in yet with that group, uh, you're certainly welcome to come. Wednesday, 9 o'clock. Uh, also Wednesday, in that evening, same evening, 
Um, the uh, welcome committee will be meeting. That's a uh, Zoom meeting. And uh, let me know if you'd like to participate in that. Those who are on that committee, certainly uh, that's a reminder to them that that's, uh, that's on Wednesday next. Glad you're all back. We had a couple of Sundays here where, uh, you know, we had great attendance Christmas Day Sunday and New Year's Day Sunday. We were worried nobody was going to show up, but people did. Uh, but uh, nowhere near everybody who's here today, so this is great. Thank you for uh, coming, so I want to say welcome back. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for circling back. And uh, for Epiphany Sunday, it's, a, it's an important Sunday, I think, in the, in the life of uh, the church and a good chance to celebrate. Uh, in that spirit, uh, I'm going to ask Mike Gillette to stand up so we can all appreciate the shirt that he chose to wear today. <laughs> Had the guts to wear today, really, because man, that thing's on fire. All right. <laughs> well done. I love it. <laughs> Uh, your offering is invited as we sing our uh, doxology now. Consider your giving uh, to our church and the ministries of our church uh, that uplift the light of God and reflect the light of God uh, that we feel on Epiphany, the light of God in our lives, uh, out into the wider world uh, to bring about God's healing, God's redemption, God's love and grace that this world is in such need of uh, these days. Uh, so uh, the offering plates are at the exits to the sanctuary. If you'd like to donate that way, there is a QR code here as well. You can donate in that way as well. Your offering is invited. Today we're focusing on the uh, arrival of the Magi. It's a great story from Scripture, one of my favorite uh, texts uh, in uh, Matthew, and where is the only account of this. Uh, this is the second chapter, uh, the beginning. It reads like this. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may go also and pay him homage. When they, heard, when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then... Opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Here ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Compassionate Creator, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you know, when they talk about new people to a church, they're often referred to as seekers, as seekers. But I think that's limiting in a way. I mean, aren't we all seekers, really? It doesn't matter if this is your first time in our church this morning, or if you, like Sally Pollock, who passed away a couple of weeks ago, 62 years as a member of this church. It doesn't matter. We're all seekers. We're all seeking something, aren't we? 
The question is, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? Everybody is seeking something. That's why Google is one of the most profitable country, uh, companies on this planet. Because people go to Google every day because they are seeking. They are searching for something. Maybe people are seeking more information about the latest uh, crisis in the news. Maybe they're seeking gossip about their favorite celebrity. Maybe they're seeking information about a model of car they're thinking of buying. Even terrorists go to Google, we're told, to find terrible new ways of wreaking havoc in the world. Everybody is seeking something. What about you? What are you seeking? Maybe you're looking for that great new product that's going to make your life everything that you hoped it would be. At least that's what the ads say. Maybe it's not a product. Maybe it's not even information. Maybe you are seeking truth or peace or hope or healing. What is it that you are seeking? We're all seeking something. Our lesson from the Gospel for Epiphany is this beloved story from Matthew 2 about people who were seeking. You know the story well. When the Magi reached Jerusalem, they sought help with their search. Assuming this newborn king would be born in a palace, that's where they headed for directions. And when King Herod heard about their quest, he was disturbed, he was frightened. He, in turn, consulted the chief priests and teachers of the law, and they pointed the Magi to Bethlehem. And then Herod adds these chilling words. He says, go, go and search diligently for this child. And, and when you find him, come on back, come on back and tell me where he is so that I can go and pay him homage too. Of course, that was the last thing that Herod intended to do was go worship Jesus his motives were far more sinister. But the Magi left, and they did find the child. And when they found him, they bowed down and they worshipped him. And they opened their treasure chests and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because their search was over. They had found what they were seeking. So to return to that question again, what is it that you are seeking? Everybody is seeking something in this life. It's clear what Herod was seeking. Herod was seeking to preserve his power. We've discussed this before about Herod's character, or lack thereof. Herod was a bloody tyrant. History records that Herod murdered many of his own family members, including his favorite wife. I say favorite because he had ten. Murdered her, murdered her grandfather, her brother, some of his own children. On one occasion he had the whole Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body of the Jewish government, assassinated, all of them. On another occasion he had every notable man in Jerusalem murdered. He was very capable of the horrendous crime reported uh, later in the Christmas narrative that we talked about last week, the slaughter of the innocents. And I think Herod's character has ample relevance in our world today because there are still people whose minds are that warped. And I'm not just talking about political tyrants. There are Herods in company offices. There are Herods in service institutions. There are Herods in government. There are Herods in schools. There are Herods in many homes. There are Herods, yes, even in churches. Herod was driven by the need to maintain his power. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, they were also seeking, but they were simply seeking to maintain the status quo. Herod was disturbed after this visit by the Magi, so he called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law and asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied. 
And they, of course, were right, because Christ was born in Bethlehem. Now, this is the same group of people that would lock horns with Jesus later in his life. They locked horns with him because Jesus would not leave well enough alone. He kept upsetting the apple cart. And all the chief priests and teachers of the law, all they wanted was to simply maintain the status quo. That's the role of religion, isn't it? To maintain tradition? To to keep things as they are? Now, that's both a strength and a weakness of the church, that we love for things to stay the same. And there's a value in that. There's a value in maintaining things as they are. Because there's a predictability to tradition that's helpful. It's comforting. As long as, as long as you know why you're doing it. There's a great story about a recent seminary graduate who went to his first church. It was a rural country church, long history in the church. It was his first service there, and he was leading the, uh, the worship service, and he noticed right away that everybody came in to worship, and they sat down on one side of the church. And that seemed kind of weird. Side court was sort of strange that they would do that, a little odd. And then when it came time to sing the hymn just before the sermon, the pastor was amazed to see the entire congregation stand up and walk over to the other side of the church and sit down and sing the hymn. That was really weird. The pastor couldn't figure out why. Nobody explained it to him. Same thing happened the next week and the week after that. And finally, he pieced it together and found out that many years earlier, the church was heated by a wood stove over on the one side of the building. And people would come in and be cold in the winter, so they'd all go over and sit over by the wood stove on that side of the, on that side of the building. And as the service would go on, this this wood stove would get really hot. (laughs) And so, too warm for comfort. And so the congregation developed this practice of moving over to the other side of the church before the hymn, before the sermon, to cool off a bit. And they did exactly that, even though the church building had been remodeled several times over. The The wood stove was long gone. They had central heating. But the congregation still kept this practice of changing sides during the service. And most of the members didn't even know why. They just did what you did. It's just what you do. It's tradition. It's tradition. Maybe that's why so many churches are so resistant to change, because they are comfortable doing the things that they've always done without realizing why they do them. Sometimes you have to bring the church kicking and screaming into the modern world. Because we love the status quo. So did the chief priests and teachers of the law. So Herod sought sought to maintain his power. The chief priests and uh, religious leaders sought to maintain tradition, their traditions. And finally, there were the Magi, right? They were also seeking, of course. They were foreigners. They were Gentiles. But they were seeking the newborn king of the Jews. It's a shame they didn't have Google or Siri or some sort of GPS on their camels, because that would have been nice. Instead, they were dependent on this bright light from the heavens to guide them, to lead them on their way. And it led them first to Jerusalem. If they had had modern technology, they would not have had to ask for Herod's help in refining their search. And then maybe Herod would not have been alerted to what was going on. Magi were from Persia, which is modern-day Iraq. And they were considered to be skilled scientists of their day, skilled in philosophy and science and medicine and astrology. Some say they were the priestly order of Persia, advisors to Persian rulers. How did they know? How did they know that this child that they sought was to be born king of the Jews? Well, maybe is because they had contact with the Jewish community in Persia, left there from the days when the Jews were held captive in that land. But no definitive answer is given in Scripture, how they knew that. They were just led by a star. 
first of all to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, to this house where the young child lay. And that's kind of important because while the wise men are there in our crash in our manger scenes, they didn't arrive until much later, some say even two years later into Bethlehem. But their purpose was the same, of course, to worship this newborn king. And that is exactly what they did. When they came to the house where the child was with Mary, they worshiped him and they presented him with these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Herod was seeking power. Chief priests, teachers of the law, were seeking to maintain the status quo. But the Magi were seeking a newborn king so that they might worship him. So I ask one last time, what is it that you are seeking? My guess is, because you're here, you're seeking God. I hope you are, anyway. I hope you realize the dangers in life of seeking anything else, really. Power, wealth, pride, even attachment to the status quo gets you nowhere, really. Instead, you're here. We're all here, seeking something else, something more. We're seeking a connection, a connection to the divine that can bring greater meaning to our days and greater direction for our divided world. That can be a long journey. That can be a long journey. But like the Magi, even if we have to stop for directions, we will find that connection. And we'll find it in the most unlikely places. And when we do, like the Magi, will understand the true power and purpose of God's light in our lives. We'll understand the true power and purpose of our own discipleship. We'll understand the true power and purpose of worship in our lives. Let us pray. Gracious God, like the Magi of Scripture, we are seeking. We are seeking you in our lives and in our world. As we enter this epiphany season, shine your light upon us and upon our church so that we can be guided to you and to the ways of your Holy Spirit. Bless First Congregational Church as we seek as we seek to celebrate the diverse ways that you come to us in Jesus Christ today and always. In his name we pray. Amen. Began to ring. A bell, the stocks, and they began to.